If you're traveling abroad and you're in need of automotive transport at your destination, it used to be that pretty much the only choice was to rent a gas guzzler. Apart from the occasional Nissan Leaf or incredibly expensive Tesla rental as Nikki covered way back in 2018, it was pretty hard to get your hands on a rental EV. These days, things are shifting, and as we found on our trip back to the UK to see my family, the cost to rent an EV can work out about the same as, or even cheaper than, its equivalent gasoline counterpart, once fuel costs are included. That said, we're not quite at the level of convenience of the gas car in terms of places to fill up, and there can be some quirks when you're in a broadland. And just as customs, currencies and cultures vary from country to country, so does charging infrastructure. So what do you need to know before you get behind the wheel when you're abroad? The very first time I tried to fuel a gasoline car in the US, I spent quite a bit of time looking like a bit of a pillock. <laughs> because it turned out that you have to pay first in many gas stations in the US. That is entirely not a thing in the UK because why would you want to go into the horrible little shop more than once? And so I stood there waiting patiently for the person behind the counter to wake the pump up. Then I moved the car to a second pump thinking there might be something wrong and tried for a bit before being summoned unceremoniously to the counter over the tannoy. In the same way, during my trip back to the UK, I found that twice we got directed to charges I couldn't use, and so to save you from that pain and torment, here's five tips to save you stress and time on your vacation. And just to head this one off at the pass, if you're thinking, oh, I'll just rent a Tesla and use the superchargers, that works fine in the US, so long as you stick to areas with good supercharger coverage, but in Europe, while you could do that, all modern European Tesla EVs are equipped with CCS, and so there are a bunch of chargers that you could use that you won't be able to if you just stick to the Tesla superchargers. Okay, let's get into it. Tip number one, contactless payment. For our European viewers, it may come as a shock to know that many US banks and credit unions still issue credit and debit cards which don't have contactless payment as an option. For our US viewers, it might come as a surprise to realize that contactless payment is not just the norm in many European countries. In fact, in some places, they don't really take cash or contact payment at all. If you're using an EV abroad, the majority of rapid charges will have no way to accept chip and pin, or for the even more retro of you, magnetic stripe swipe payments that can be used on many US chargers. For those going the other way, many US chargers will take contactless payment, but some would still require chip and pin. If you're wondering if your card has contactless payment as an option, it will have this symbol on it, if it does. It's worth letting your bank know that you'll be out of the country and using the card abroad and checking with them that contactless payments will work for you outside your home country, however. But what if your bank or credit union like mine issues cards that don't do contactless payments? Well, the easiest solution is to set up Apple Pay or Google Pay or some other contactless payment system on your phone. I checked this worked using my phone at several rapid charges and it worked just fine, at least in the UK. This is also why Nikki and I have British bank accounts active, because we both transfer money to our UK bank accounts to pay for things while we're there. It's just easier. Tip number two. Charger and navigation apps. Talk to local EV drivers before you go and find an app that works. We tried two different apps in the UK, ZapMap and a better route planner. A better route planner gave us more accurate range predictions and produced better results overall for us. That said, it's what I use in the US, so I'm pretty used to it. ZapMap seemed to provide some somewhat quirky routing suggestions and also didn't seem willing to push the range on the car, leading to more charging stops. But your mileage may vary. 
However, twice on our trip, a better route planner led us astray. The first time it directed us to a private charger inside a DHL depot. Only as I scanned over the route ahead of our departure did I realise what it had done and tweaked the route by saying not to use that charger. The second time we weren't quite so lucky. The charger it selected was a Volvo or Polestar only charger, which looked from the comments like it was open to the public. But when we arrived it turned out to be for Volvo and Polestar owners only. I vaguely thought that might be the case and should have taken that vague thought to heart as it led to more hassle than was necessary. So make sure when you plan that route that you check where it's suggesting you stop. And if you've got some long drives planned before you go, check out those routes ahead of time. Sitting at a laptop and checking that a charger is comfortably doable over a cup of tea is a much nicer process than some of the alternatives. Oh, and remember to check if those chargers are single-headed chargers and allow some extra time if they are. A lot of the chargers we ended up using only had one stall, particularly as we got out into the sticks or on older bits of the motorway charging network, and that does mean that you're reliant on it both working and not being occupied before you can continue your journey. Tip number three. Join network memberships. And while we're thinking about chargers, it may be 2022, but there are still some networks out there partying like it's 1999, and they think it's okay to function only for their members. Not to offer discounts for membership. I mean, not to work at all if you're not a member. And I'm not picking on Volvo here. Although, really Volvo? That's uncool. No. I encountered Ionity, which looked like it would charge for anyone, but the unit I used refused to start charging without a membership, and Revive, a network with a charger that I accidentally routed to from the Volvo incident, not realising that it was a members-only charger. Thankfully it was less than half a mile away from the Volvo one. Ionity I'd signed up for ahead of time, knowing that it required an app. Pro tip, you can use online payment processors like PayPal, Apple or Google Pay when you sign up for some of these because some companies don't accept out-of-country credit cards. Tesla similarly requires membership and an app to start charging, although I let Tesla off that somewhat because its chargers have no screens. Downloading and setting that app up ahead of time allowed me to pull up in my non-Tesla to Tesla's chargers and initiate charging without a bother. Revive, however... That was a different story. I wasted about five minutes attempting to sign up for its service when I pulled up at its charger before deciding that I would just skip to a different non-member locked charger because the website wouldn't even load on my phone. Ionity, like I said, needed an app to function. That wasn't region locked on the app store, so downloading it after setting up a membership worked just fine. In our region of the Pacific Northwest, there's a variety of smaller charging networks, particularly in and around Seattle and Portland, and those sometimes do need a membership. And so setting up that ahead of time can save you an unnecessary headache. So when you're looking at those routes ahead of your journey, take a moment to skip around and see what other networks and charges are available. Check out the comments and listings to see if they're member only, and a heads up, Sometimes, because some charging companies are clearly into historical reenactment, they still actually require a physical RFID card. No, I'm not joking. Those are probably not worth your time since they probably won't send the card abroad, and it's worth taking a moment before you go to pop into your chosen app and eliminate those networks from your route planning. Tip number four. Make sure you have internet access. I am very bad about arranging internet access at a decent speed ahead of a journey. My phone's provider cheerfully tells me on their side that I can get data when I'm abroad. What didn't click was that it is painfully slow. It worked okay for the most part for getting chargers to start, but when we were sat at the Volvo charger attempting to locate another charger nearby, getting a better route planner to work was, well, it took time. A whole lot of precious time. Similarly, the Revive Network website works fine if you have a fast data or Wi-Fi connection, but the spot I was in I had neither and it wouldn't load properly, which made the oh this charger is for members only thing a lot more of a pain. 
So it is worth it, particularly if you think you're going to be doing a lot of unplanned driving, to make sure that you have decent internet access and make sure all those apps can actually work. And finally, tip number five. Check destination charging. I was, as you might guess, heading back to see my family, so plugging in when we got there was no bother at all. My mum has an outlet in the garage and the rental car came with a granny lead. In Europe those are plenty powerful enough to keep your car topped up unless you're doing a ton of driving and so charging there was fine. But ahead of seeing her we isolated up in the Lake District and despite checking beforehand it turned out that charging there was a bit of a pain. The nearest local charger was outside a pub, which the owners had conveniently switched to being for residents of the attached hotel only. They'd not seen fit to update the notes in ZapMap or in the open charge network though, so that was unhelpful. I had ahead of time asked our Airbnb hosts if we could charge there. They said yes, but when we got to actually charging it turned out to be an exciting ride of combating misinformation and their misconceptions about how much electricity we might actually use. Instead of letting us just plug in until the car was charged and pay for the electrons, they only let it charge for a few hours, then unplugged our car, meaning that we left with about 80% instead of the 100% we planned for. That irritation meant we had to replan our route and add an extra stop, all in a bit of a hurry while packing the car and leaving at 6am. Which is how we ended up at that Volvo charger. Travelling in the US we've run into dead chargers at hotels that clearly haven't worked for a very long while and where staff have no idea about them. So we recommend that you get a really clear answer about whether there is charging at the destination and whether there are any restrictions that apply if you're planning to charge there. Oh, and a quick bonus tip that's related. Don't rely on your car being full at pickup. Just like gas cars, they may well arrive not anywhere near full. So that's our five top tips. We're sure there are a bunch of other things that you'd watch out for, so go ahead and drop your thoughts for EV driving abroad in the comments below. That's it for today. Thank you for watching, and we'll be back soon with more. If you liked the video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and sharing it with your friends, and don't forget to leave your thoughts below or in our free to join Discord chat room. There's a link in the video description. And if you really liked it, why not leave us a super thanks? It's easy to do and everything you send goes towards helping us make great content. If you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolve Take 2, and give the bell a gentle ring to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew go out to everyone who makes TE possible. That includes everyone who supports us on Patreon and on YouTube as well as those of you who just watch the video and share it. If you're a supporter at the Charged Up level, you'll see your name here on my right. And if you just joined, we're sorry if your name isn't showing. We currently render the list out every week or so, but sometimes our videos are produced a few weeks in advance. Thanks to our self-driving tier supporters, Chris Maxwell, Pedro Muro Pinheiro, Patrick Boyarski, Bennett Elder, Brian Newton, David Kitchen, Michael Goad, Ricky Leong, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahota, Brophy Wolf, Tessa in the Gong, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Kyle Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Regine Fellows, Dan Blair, Jim Burness, Chris Centre, Chris and Michael Johnson, Peter Dillinger, and Denny Hyde. And of course, out of this world, thanks to our Starman supporters, Anonymous Freak, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Rory Litwin, Joe Bresney, Reed R, JP Fakerback, Russ, Will Graylin, Matthew Drobnak, Kevin Burrowbridge, John Lyons, Andrew Glenn, Paul Conway, Laura Reynolds, Ellery Hensley, and of course, Ian. Want to be part of the amazing list? You can join Patreon at the link below. Hit the join button below to support us on YouTube, or show us your support through Bitcoin, Kofi, or our cool swag store. Links are all down there. And if you're unable to support us financially, just know that watching the video and sharing it makes a real difference to our ad revenue. It also keeps the algorithm confined. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving!